All right, if you will, take your Bible and open up to Genesis chapter 48. I've entitled this message, A Man's Last Words. Have you ever thought about what you would say to your family, to your children, perhaps to a close friend, if you knew you were about to die? If you, if you thought that today was the last day that you had on this earth, and you had the opportunity to say something to your family, to a close friend, what would you say? Warren Wisby writes, a man's last words are significant. They are a window into his heart and a measure that helps us evaluate his life. Men, do you realize that what you would say to your family, if it was your last day, tells us what is most important to you? At the time of David's death, he called for his son Solomon to come to him. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1-3 through 3 tells us what he said. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon his son. I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said, so be strong. Show yourself a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in His ways. Keep His decrees and commands so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. You see, David knew how difficult this life is. Have you all learned how difficult this life is? And David was concerned about Solomon's future. And so, he, he also knew that there was only one who could guide his son through this life and ultimately save him. Thus, with his last words, David, in essence, tells Solomon to trust his life over to God. You see, David knew the Lord personally. The Lord was his shepherd. And he wanted to make sure that Solomon knew and trusted the same Savior. And so, before he breathed his last breath, he pointed Solomon to Jesus. If you were on your deathbed, let me ask you this question. Would you know how to point someone to God? Would that be even a consideration that was on your mind? Is that, would that be the, the desire of your heart? Tonight we come to Genesis chapter 48. In this chapter, in chapter 49, we have recorded for us Jacob's last words. Jacob is now an old man. In fact, he's 147 years old. His life is ebbing away and he knows it. But he still has some very important business that he wants to take care of before he takes his last breath. And so Jacob, he has three things that he wants to say. Here they are in your outline. He wanted to share his testimony with Joseph. In so doing, he wanted to remind Joseph to walk with God. Secondly, Jacob wanted to bless Joseph because of all that Joseph had done for his family. He, he wanted to bless Joseph by adopting his two sons and then praying for them. And third, he wanted to prophesy over all of his sons. And we're going to cover that next week when we look at Genesis chapter 49. So tonight, what I want us to do is I want us to examine carefully Jacob's last words so that we can see what is really important to this godly man before he dies. Last week we read that Pharaoh gave the best land to Jacob's sons since they were shepherds. And so the Israelites settled in the region of Goshen. And there they began to prosper and to multiply like rabbits. Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years. And he, saw the, he saw the famine come to an end. He saw life in Egypt returning to normal. It was becoming prosperous again. But even as Jacob lived in Egypt with his, with his family, he longed for home. Egypt was not his home. He was living in a tent and he longed for a better country. And so Jacob asked Joseph to promise him that the moment that he died, that he would take his body and bury it back in Canaan. And Joseph swore that he would. And so chapter 47 ends with Israel, which is the, the God-given name of, to, of Jacob. We see Jacob worshiping the Lord. That's how Jacob ends his life, worshiping God. That's how I want to end my life. Don't you want to end your life worshiping God? You see, see, Jacob's life did not begin well, but it ended well. And that's all that really matters. Hebrews 11.21 states, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. Guys, when I look at Jacob's faith, it kind of reminds me of my own faith. It's a, it's a, his faith was a wavering faith, but it was real. And because he had a real faith, he had a testimony about his relationship with God. And that's what he wanted to share with Joseph. He wanted to share his testimony with him. So let me ask you, to be honest, do you have a testimony? 
Let's take a look at Jacob's testimony. Look at verses 1 through 4. Take your Bible. I know Joe made a big deal about you. We put the, Joe doesn't like the fact that we put the verses up here. He thinks you should open up a Bible, which I, I agree with him. So I want you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 48 so you can know what the Genesis is in, in the Bible. Okay? Genesis chapter 48, beginning with verse 1. You should know that since we're at the very end of Genesis. All right, we read, Sometime later Joseph was told, Your father's ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. So before he died, Jacob wanted to tell Joseph about the time God appeared to him. What an incredible testimony. Yes, he was a sinner. Yes, he was known for being a deceiver. And at many times he failed to totally trust God, but in spite of his sinfulness, in spite of the fact that he had a, had a wavering faith, Jacob knew the Lord. And thus he had a testimony. Do you have a testimony? And what exactly is a testimony? In your outline. A believer's testimony is simply a declaration of faith. It's a personal statement whereby a man testifies that he knows God. A testimony is a public declaration that a man has a relationship with God, with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have a testimony. It, it means, men, that you actually have a relationship with God and you're willing to tell others about it. I'll never forget that time I was playing... Um, I think I told you I, I, I used to have an addiction to playing chess on the Internet. Now, back in December, I told my wife, guys, this has been going on for 15 years. I learned to play chess on the internet when I was in seminary. I think I've told you all that before. And it was a big mistake because I, I just got addicted to it. I could literally play two or three hours a day. And just come up for air and then go play two or three more hours. In fact, I used to ask my wife, oh, are you going for a walk in a few minutes? Because I want to get out of the house so I can play chess. <laughs> but anyway, so I, you, when, you, when you play chess online, you're literally, you're, you're playing a live game with someone and they can actually chat. With, I wasn't into the chatting part, but one time um, I was playing this guy who was from somewhere like Saudi Arabia. He was, he was a from a Muslim country. So I asked him, I said, um, I typed in there, are you, a, are you a Muslim? He said, yes. I said, do you believe in Allah? He said, yes, with about three exclamation points. Then I knew I, I had him. I said, do you know him? He had no answer. He said, what do you mean? So I began to tell him what it means to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. And he told me we needed to bring this conversation to an end. But see, to have a testimony, you must know God and have a relationship with Him. And so when I look at Jacob's testimony, I see three essential components that need to be a part of every man's testimony. In fact, I will tell you, men, that if, if you don't understand, if you don't have these three components, that's a big red flag. And here they are. You see, a true believer has spiritual sight. A true believer has spiritual hearing. Or, or spiritual ears. A true believer has spiritual hope. Now I want us to think about each one of these. First, I want us to consider spiritual sight. What do I mean when I say that you, you need to have spiritual sight or spiritual eyes? Well, look at verse 3. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me. Did y'all see that? He appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan. Now I'm not exactly sure what it means that God appeared to him, but I, here's what I believe. I believe that it was the pre-incarnate Christ that Jacob saw. This is known as a theophany. A, the a theophany is the visible manifestation of God in physical form to a human being. So this is what I believe. I believe that when it says God appeared to him, I believe that Jacob saw, saw the physical appearance of Jesus before his incarnation. The incarnation is simply when God took on flesh and became a man. It's what the virgin birth is all about. When Jesus appeared on this earth, that, that was the incarnation. And so all these appearances of God in the Old Testament, when He appeared to Abraham, when He appeared to Moses in the burning bush, I believe when it says when He walked with Adam, when He appeared to Jacob, I believe these are all the pre-incarnate Christ. Because I believe that, um, that when God manifests Himself, it's always through the second person of the Trinity 
Who is? Jesus. And who are we going to see when we get to heaven? How many gods are we going to see? One. What will his name be? Jesus. In the New Testament, we learn that Jesus, after he ascended into heaven, appeared to Saul, who later became Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus. And when John was exiled on the island of Patmos, it says the Lord appeared to him. And you may not believe this, but I, I do. I've read... Num now, if it was just one account, I might you know, say I'm not sure about that. But I've read numerous accounts of Jesus appearing to Muslims in the last four or five years. Now, why would he do that? Well, that's another sermon. Why do you think he might more likely appear to a Muslim in Iran than to um, Hart and Sigmund in Raleigh, North Carolina? What's that? They don't, they, don't, they don't have copies of the Bible. They don't have a Bible study in Tehran that they can go sign up for. They sign up for it, they're going to go to prison more than likely. But, what, but listen... I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning all these accounts where God physically appeared and where Jesus physically appeared, but that's not really what I'm talking about when I talk about spiritual sight or spiritual eyes. By spiritual sight, I'm referring to seeing with the eyes of your heart. To have spiritual sight, a man must first be born again. In, Luke, in John chapter 3, we read about the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. You need to understand who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was the spiritual teacher of the nation of Israel. He'd be kind of like the Pope or like the head honcho of, the, you know, of a, a major domination. He'd be the spiritual leader. Jesus um, referred to him as the teacher of Israel, but essentially what Jesus said to him, he said, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. You see, when Nicodemus came to Jesus that night, he was religious but lost. Now, I want you to hear what Jesus said to this very nice, very kind, brilliant religious teacher named Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus looked into Nicodemus' eyes and declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's what? Born again. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said that a man cannot see the kingdom of God unless he's first born again? The kingdom of God's invisible, is it not? So how can you see it? Well, here's what Jesus meant. Until a man is born again, he cannot understand spiritual matters. He cannot understand things that have to do with the kingdom of God. A man who has not been born again and thus is not indwelt by the Holy Spirit cannot understand what it means to be saved. When a man like that, who's not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which means he has not been born again, when he reads the Bible, it doesn't really click. It doesn't make, make sense. When a man like that is driving down the road and he's listening to a preacher on the radio, he thinks that man is foolish because he cannot see. You see, the word see, S-E-E, -E, simply means to understand. It's like the moment a first grader sees that 2 plus 2 equals 4. You ever taught your, you know, your first grader how to do math? And they, they, just, they just don't get it. You take two marbles out there and add two more and you show them this four and they finally get it. See, they see it. They understand. That's what it means to see. And this is why Anselm, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury around the year 1000 AD, said, I do not seek to understand so that I might believe. But I believe so that I might understand. And for this also I know, that unless I have believed, I cannot understand. Do you see? You see, the Bible teaches this truth, that faith precedes understanding. Understanding is the reward of faith. It's like riding a bicycle. Do you remember when your dad maybe took you out there and you did not really believe you could ride it? And, but he put you up there on that bicycle and he said, I believe in you, you can do it. And all of a sudden he's pushing you down the street and you start pedaling and you're looking and they're, they're, you look back and he's 100 yards behind you. You didn't think that you could ride it. You didn't understand how you could ride it. But all of a sudden, you see that you can. 
And you took a... See, what happened is you had to take a step of faith to get on that bike and trust your dad. That's what has to happen, men, in order to really see. You have to take a step of faith. You learn one little baby biblical truth and you say, I believe that. And you take a step of faith and you find that, that, that God will support your faith. It, it, all of a sudden, you see it. Then you take another step. And that's how your faith grows. You must be born again first in order to truly see and understand. Do you see? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, you see the, the gospel seems like foolishness, foolishness to most of the people of the world. And they cannot understand it. Why? Because they're spiritually blind. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, The man without the Spirit. Who's the man without the Spirit? He's the man who has not been born again. He's the man who is not a Christian. Do you, do you understand, men, that if you're not born again, you're not a Christian? I don't care how long you've been going to a church. You, you're either born again or you're not. And the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so, men, to have a testimony, you must be able to see spiritually. You must be able to understand spiritual matters. And you must understand what it means to be saved. And this explains why that Jesus said that He came into the world to give sight to the blind. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Jesus healed the man who'd been born blind. Everybody in town knew He was blind. He, he was born blind. He'd been walking around all his life with a cane, trying to find his way around. He wasn't faking. You can't fake for 30 years. Everybody knew he was blind. And Jesus healed him. And all of a sudden, he could see. And he dropped that cane, and he's running around town telling everybody, I can see. Do you know how had a problem with it? The Pharisees, because now they got a problem. They, now this man is living proof, living evidence that's almost been shoved in front of their noses that Jesus is who He claimed to be. And so they did everything they could to, to try to discredit this man. Until finally the man says, listen, I don't know who this man is who healed me. All I know is this, once I was blind and now I can see. And you know what they did to him? They kicked him out of the synagogue. You know what that means? That means basically he was cut off from society. He was an outcast. And so Jesus came to him. In John chapter 9, verses 35 through 41, I want you to listen carefully to this encounter between Jesus and this blind man who now can see. It says that Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. For judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Let me repeat that. Jesus looked at them and said, if you, were, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. What did Jesus mean by this? Well, here's what He meant. These religious teachers in their fancy robes proudly claimed to be followers of Moses. And thus they claimed that they had spiritual enlightenment. But if a, if a man claims to know God and have spiritual understanding... But he's not been born again. He is blind and his guilt remains. It doesn't matter about his religiosity. On the other hand, when a sinful man recognizes that he's blind and that he's lost, he cries out for a Savior to rescue him. Then Jesus opens his eyes so he can see and his guilt no longer remains. Do you see? There are many today who claim to see, 
Yet sadly, in spite of their religiosity, they remain blind. I mean, I want you to understand this truth. Religion is the enemy of God. Because religion works to keep a man in his blindness. Do, do you understand that? It's hard to grasp that, some, that sometimes in the Bible Belt. Because we've grown up in a region with so much religiosity and churchism. But it, it, see, what happens is, we begin to think that, well, my grandparents went to church, my parents went to church, I'm going to church. And the man in the pulpit is telling me, we're all God's children. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed and hop in the boat and we're all going to heaven. That's not the way it works. Jesus said to Nicodemus, who is more religious than any man in this room, He said, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. That's your spiritual sight. How about your spiritual hearing? How is that? Look at verse 3 again. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Jacob heard the force of, heard the voice of God. Have you ever heard his voice? And what does it mean to hear his voice? Well, just like your physical eyes. I'm not talking about your physical ears. And my job, in case you haven't figured this out, is to try to explain the invisible. You see, in order to have a real testimony, you must hear with your spiritual ears. This is why Jesus said in Matthew eleven fifteen, He who has ears, let him hear. How many of His listeners had ears? All of them. So what was He talking about? In John... Jesus spoke to John, excuse me, in Revelation, Jesus spoke to John about the churches in Revelation. And he said several times, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you ever sensed God speaking to you? By the way, the primary means through which God speaks to us is through what? The Bible. You pick up the Bible, you read it, and I'm telling you, men, if you take your Bible and read it, and you say, before you read it, say, Lord, would you speak to me from your word? Do you think he's going to ignore that? Day after day, if he sees a man come into his office or, you know, in, in, your, in your house, wherever you get along with God, if you get down on your knees day after day, and you ask God every day, God, will you speak to me? Do you think he's going to ignore that? Do you know why he's not speaking to you? Because you're not opening up the Bible and reading it. I have a friend who's going through a very difficult time in his life. In fact, he would tell you that this is the most difficult thing that he's ever encountered in his life. He told me that um, at the beginning of the year, he decided he was going to read through the one-year Bible. Remember, I challenged you guys to do that. And so last week, he sent me this email. Here's what it says verbatim. As you know, I'm working my way through the one-year Bible. I cannot believe what my psalm reading was yesterday and my Proverbs reading was today. The verses speak volumes to me and it means the Lord is speaking to me as well as hearing my prayers. You see, one of the um, very good things about going through a trial, a hardship, is it has a tendency to awaken you spiritually. In fact, I think it's C.S. Lewis who said that God speaks to us I don't have the quote exactly right, but God speaks to us when things are going well, but in the storms of life, He shouts at us. He gets our attention. You mean, don't wait for a storm to have to come into your life for God to get your attention. Go to Him now. Jesus said in John 10, verses 14 and 27, which, is, which are two of the most clear verses in the Bible that explain what it means to have a relationship with God. He said, I, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep what? Know me. See, he knows who his sheep are. You can't fool him. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jacob knew the Lord. He saw him with his eyes and he heard him with his ears and thus he had a testimony. And his testimony was the one thing that he wanted to share with Joseph before he died. And finally, because of his relationship with God, Jacob had spiritual hope. You see, the Lord had promised him that he would bring him back to the land. And God promised Jacob that he would give the land to him 
and his descendants as what? An everlasting possession. And this land became known as the promised land. See, man, here's one of the great things about being a Christian. When you have a relationship with God, then you have a similar hope in the promised land. It's called what? Heaven. Eternal life in heaven is the believer's great hope. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. You know what? We were made for another world. And I believe this is what God meant when He told Jacob that He would give him this land as an everlasting possession. And this gave Jacob great hope and he wanted to pass this hope on to his son and to his grandsons. Do you have the same hope? Do you know if heaven is your real home? Do you know that? Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 10 states, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Man, here's something that's so true. If you are in Christ, then you understand that you're living in a foreign country. This world is not a home. These bodies that we live in are nothing more than tents compared to the eternal and glorious bodies that believers will inherit one day at the resurrection. And this is our great hope. And this is what I'm personally living for. I told one of my sons the other day that pretty much all I do is um, I get up in the morning, I go to my office, I read the Bible all day. I, then I go and exercise in the afternoon. I go home and eat dinner. I watch O'Reilly. I go to bed. And I get there the next morning, I do that again. And that's pretty much the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to be doing. I'll read the Bible, go exercise, go with my wife, watch a rally, go to bed. And you know what? I'm very content with that. Because I can't do much anymore. I used to be able to water ski and surf and play basketball and do a few other things. But my body is just wearing out. And so I am looking forward to the day when I get my resurrected body. And so men, I'm serious. This is all I'm living for. And I'm trying to, I, I, I like the things of this world. I love all the toys that we can have. I, I, you know, I love boating and fishing and all those things. God made us to love those things. But we can't take them with us. And they're all wearing out. They're all breaking down. And so I am living for the world that is coming. And this is the one thing that I want to pass on to my two sons. And I have passed on to them. And I'm going to pass it on to my two grandsons. And my two daughters-in-law are both pregnant right now. So I've got two more coming. And I'm going to pass it on to them. You see, I have a testimony. This is the most valuable thing I possess. I have this treasure in a jar of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from me. You see, the gospel that the believer possesses is a priceless treasure. Eternal life. How can you measure it? And this is the one treasure that I want to pass on to my sons and my grandsons. I want them to have eternal life. I want to know that one day in heaven will be my two sons and ever how many grandchildren my, my father gives me. You see, heaven, I, mean, I want you to understand this. Heaven is real and it's coming. The world around us is passing away. Everything we see is temporary. And I'm trying to convince some of you to believe that which you cannot see. But you must have faith to see. Hebrews 11.1 1 states, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I've never been more certain of anything in my life. And that is what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob possessed. Eyes that could see the invisible. And this is what Jacob wanted to pass on to his sons and his grandsons. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16 states, All these people, talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Noah, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. Uh, so what things did they not receive? 
Health, wealth, and prosperity. What were you saying? Huh? The promised land. So they died, and that's why, just to, don't waste your time listening to Joel Osteen. What Joel Osteen is promising is what we're going to get in heaven. He's way ahead of schedule. Because what some of us may face, if you want to follow Jesus, is suffering. The world will hate you because of His name. And persecution is coming to America. And so, don't tell me about health and wealth and prosperity. If you can't preach it in Mosul, Iraq, then it shouldn't be preached in Houston, Texas. What we preach here, you should be able to preach in a prison in Iran. If you can't, then don't preach it. And so what they're promising on television often is not the truth. Prosperity is coming in heaven. Prosperity here is simply having the Holy Spirit in you. And He promises to take you through the storms of life. And so all these people were still living by faith when they died. And they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And that's what I'm doing. I'm welcoming what God has promised me from a distance because I know it's coming. And I can wait for it. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. My wife and I have said so many times, we don't fit in here anymore. I don't fit in. I am strange to the world and the world is strange to me. I'm an alien. Y'all probably already had that figured out, didn't you? But see, people who say such things, see, the world would say that people who say such things are crazy lunatics. They would think I'm a raving idiot. I'm raving, but I don't think I'm an idiot. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they've been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. I could go back to what I was doing before, although I'm starting to get a little old. I had a good job. I was making right much money. And people sometimes ask me, what do you miss about your old job? I just say the money. <laughs> I wouldn't go back for anything in the world. For one thing, we wouldn't be sitting here. And listen, I take no credit for this. All I am is a horrible sinner who's been saved by God's grace. And I'm talking to a bunch of sinners who may not all be saved, but you're hearing the truth. You've got to decide if you're going to believe it. And remember, faith precedes understanding. So if you don't understand, then you've got to believe first. All these people were living by faith when they died. And they, were, they, they could have returned to the country they had left. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He's prepared a city for them. Do you have this hope? Do you have spiritual eyes that see and spiritual ears that hear? Or are you like the Pharisees and so many religious people today who go to church? They are forever hearing but never truly understanding. Here's a warning from Jesus. It's found in Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus said, This is why I speak to them in parables. See, the disciples were all of a sudden wondering, Why you start to talk in parables? And he was doing that primarily with the Pharisees. Do you know why he was doing that? He loved the Pharisees, even though they were going to nail him to the cross. And the Pharisees were smart. They, were, they, were, they had a high intellect. And so the thing about a parable, it's got a nugget of truth in it. So you have to think to figure it out. And so speaking in parables was part of His mercy. He was extending to them His grace. Maybe that it would get their mind to thinking and they would discover the nugget and it would draw them to truth. So He said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You'll be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They only hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, not these ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. If you sit here tonight, men, and you understand what I'm saying, and you know you have a testimony, it's not because God has lifted the veil from your eyes, and He's given you eyes that see and ears that hear. And if you have a testimony, don't wait until you're on your deathbed to share it. Share it while you can. Our time is basically up. But let me just say this. In verses 5 through 16, uh, Joseph has brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, in. 
Manasseh is the oldest, and Ephraim is the youngest. And Joseph places, so make sure I don't get this backwards, Joseph places Ephraim, excuse me, Manasseh right here, so that he's on Jacob's right side. And he places Ephraim right here, so he's on Jacob's left side. Because Joseph is thinking he's going to bless my firstborn and give him the double blessing. What does Jacob do? He crosses his hands like this. And he says, May the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully, the God who's been my shepherd, what a testimony, the God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who's delivered me from all harm. One translation says, Redeem me from all evil. So that's what it means to become a Christian. You walk with Him faithfully. He becomes your shepherd. And He redeems you from sin. May He bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham, Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. Guys, in closing tonight, I want to give you four questions to think about. Number one, I realize I'm skipping part of your outline, but number one, have you been born again? Warren Wiersbe says that when Jacob crossed his hands like this, that you, can, you should see the cross. Because what, he, what he's doing is he's giving favor. God is showing favor to the second born. It is the second born, according to Warren Wisby, whom God receives, not the first born. You must be what? Born again. John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Jesus answered Nicodemus. He said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's what? Born of water and the Spirit. What does that mean? Look, guys, listen to this carefully. We're almost done. What does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? Well, he explains it in verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. When did that take place? When you were born, physically. But Spirit gives birth to Spirit. When did that take place? When you are born again. He said, you, you should not be surprised, Nicodemus, at my saying you must be born again. Guys, here's the truth. If you're born only once, you will die twice. If you're born twice, you only die once. Now you tell me which one you want. You see, that's what we're basically offering to the world here on Tuesday nights. Why is it... Guys, answer this question for me. Why is it when you invite a man to come to Bible study, he acts like you're inviting him to come to where he's going to get slaughtered? I mean... <laughs> what, I mean, seriously, they, they look at you like you're crazy. And we're actually offering them an opportunity to be born again. So they only have to die once. <laughs> have you been born again? Second question, do you realize how short life is? See, if Jacob could speak to us tonight, he would tell you that his 147 years went by like that. In fact, he would tell you the last 3,000 plus years has gone by like that. James 4.14 states, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And so if your life is passing away so quickly, and if heaven is approaching so quickly, and you know you're going to be stepping into eternity soon, Isn't there is no second chance then. Today is the day of salvation. And third, do you have a testimony? Do you know we all have a testimony? Our lives are a living testimony of what we really believe. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. All your children of God. You become a child of God when you place your trust in Jesus Christ. In that moment, you can say, My Father who art in heaven. And you can cry out, Abba, Father. God becomes your heavenly Father. And Jesus becomes your elder brother. If you have a testimony... Are you sharing it with others? Or are you keeping it to yourself? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would do your work of lifting the veil from all of our eyes so that we can see you more clearly. And I pray that if there's a man sitting here tonight who is not sure if he's been born again, that he'll come forward and talk to me afterwards. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Bring us back safely next week. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.